In spite of having a female brain, he does not have the female behavior that Dorner's theory would predict. Mr. Blackwell is only one of the 25 hermaphrodites that Van Niekerk has treated. They identify them with their sex of feeling very strongly. Uh, I have no uh, uh, evidence of homosexualism, transvestitism, or transsexualism in them. They are absolutely adamant about the fact that uh, they are male or female according to what they were reared as. Does Mrs. Wendt's behavior agree with Dorner's theory? The sex of her brain was tested by the same phantom womb test that Dorner used on its homosexuals. Samples of her blood showed that her brain had the same reaction to estrogen as a normal male. In this, she is similar to another woman with testicles who had the same test done in Edinburgh. Both of them have, in Dorner's sense, a male brain. So if Mrs. Wendt's brain is masculinized, she should behave in masculine ways. We asked her, had the presence of two active testicles in her body ever given her male feelings or a male sex drive? I can honestly say that when I was growing up or in my 20s or even after I got married, never at any time did I ever feel um, masculine in any way. I was essentially um, feminine and uh, I had essentially a feminine role in marriage. What happens in the Caribbean supports Dorner's view, although it doesn't prove it. But the importance of the work here is not that, but that it shows that hormones do have an influence on the male brain before birth. The Nilda's four boys were brought up as girls, yet at puberty, they spontaneously felt a desire to be male, and this overrode the sex they had learned. The testosterone that had bathed their brains in the womb seems to have prepared them so they could slip easily into a male role. What has happened here may not apply to other cultures. For example, here the families were able to accept the change of a child's sex without crushing feelings of guilt and shame. Do the scientists think that what they have learned here is generally true? That maybe sex of rearing is not as important as it's been thought? But the male hormones, the androgens as they're called, may be important in forming our brains. Dr. Imperato McGinley. Well, I, I think in humans the question really remains unanswered as to, uh, especially in dealing with the male, whether androgens play a role in the development of a male gender identity. And uh, it has been thought that hormones play a very little role. That has been the dictum for 20 years. When we came across these patients, uh, we were rather shocked. Now that is not to say that sex of rearing is not important. Uh, we don't mean to say that at all. But what we mean to say is that we now have to recognize that hormones, in particular androgens, do play a role in influencing gender identity for men. So what can we say about ourselves? There is no doubt we learn much of our sexual behavior. But it also seems likely that men and women are born with different brains. We don't really know what effects these differences have in our everyday life. We don't know much about the behavior they create. They may not be important, but now we know they are there. I have with me Dr. William Maurice, a psychiatrist at the University of British Columbia and the director of the sexual therapy clinic. Dr. Maurice, first of all, what's the difference between a gender problem and a homosexual problem? Well, there's a great deal of difference between the, uh, the two phenomena that you mentioned. Uh, for one thing, gender problems, the word gender refers to maleness and femaleness, and gender identity problems refer to a sense, 
a disturbed sense of a person's uh, uh, sense of maleness or femaleness. Homosexuality, on the other hand, refers to an attraction uh, or um, love, or sexual attraction between two people of the same sex. Uh, a, a man, for example, who might be exclusively homosexual, uh, generally doesn't have any confusion about his status as a male. Uh, he knows that he's a male. He simply prefers to have another male as a love partner and as a sexual partner, so that the two are completely different. Although they may be related, uh, uh, that's something that we don't really know about at this moment. Well, how common are these gender problems? Gender problems are probably very rare. The uh, the statistics are pretty, uh, unfortunately, they are pretty lousy. Uh, they certainly weren't any better uh, several hundred years ago, uh, but they're not new. I think one could say that. And the reason one could say that is that there are historical examples, and they're uh, well written and well documented uh, in books, in the literature. Uh, one example for uh, just to introduce a bit of Canadiana into this discussion, uh, in the mid-1800s, there was a person who came from England by the name of uh, James Stewart Barry. And Dr. Barry came as Inspector General of Hospitals uh, for several cities in eastern Canada. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, Dr. Barry, in spite of having certain characteristics which confused some people, uh, Dr. Barry turned out to be female uh, when an autopsy was done at her death although uh, she went through medical school as a male. And perhaps Dr. Barry might be Canada's most famous transsexual. Now, you are studying these questions in childhood. Is it possible to prevent problems? Well, most of my experience is in dealing with adults. But uh, in recent years, there has been a very uh, significant attempt at trying to find children uh, as adults describe themselves presently. That is, adults giving the retrospective description of themselves uh, as children. If one These are adults with problems. Adults yeah. with problems. Mm -hmm. yeah. They describe uh, what they were like as children. Mm -hmm. If one were now, one can now go backwards, uh, in a sense, and try to find those children nowadays and see if one um, could possibly deal with them in a way that would prevent difficulties in later life. Well, is a tomboy likely to grow up to be a lesbian? Is the effeminate little boy likely to become a homosexual? An excellent question, and I think that, uh, that those are uh, common stereotypes, but I think that there's a vast world of difference between the two uh, for two reasons. First of all, if one uh, just looks around and uh, talks with other families, for example, you can see uh, at a glance that masculine behavior in, in young girls is very common. Feminine behavior in young boys is not. Uh, secondly, if one follows children in this situation up into adult life, uh, the outcome is vastly different. Feminine behavior in boys, uh, when one follows those boys that are presented, for example, to a clinic into adult life, one finds that a large number of them, of the order of 50%, have an atypical sexual development. They may be exclusively homosexual, they may cross-dress or be transvestite, or they may be transsexual. Now, the vast majority of girls who uh, have masculine be some masculine traits in childhood are uh, grow up to be quite usual women and from a sexual point of view, and from, every, from any other point of view as well. A small number of them, very small, and no one really knows the percentages, do indeed have problems. They, uh, perhaps might grow up to be lesbian or trans, uh, transsexuals, mm -hmm. uh, but there would be a very small percentage, and the difference is, as I've said, is, is enormous. So we see that research into the gender question is giving us a greater knowledge of what it's all about. Perhaps in future we will begin to avoid problems, and certainly it will diminish the human suffering for those involved.